Hey everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to our online experience. So great to see you during these summer days and just hoping that you feel refreshed this summer. I know I love summer's my favorite time of the year. Well, actually anytime it's hot, I just love the sun. Those of you that know me love being in the heat, love being in the sun whenever I can. And so we're just excited that you're here, that you're taking some time out of your morning to be online and hopefully you receive strength, encouragement. You know, we exist as kingdom culture to help everyone everywhere experience God in a real way. And our hope and our prayer is that you would always come away experiencing God in some way, receiving something from him. The goal is that God would speak to you through this message, that God would speak to you through the experience online, whether it's just online only or you come live and in person, which by the way, we'd love to see you. We're going to pick it up for week two of our mini uh, two-part series on Jeremiah, on Jeremiah, really we're talking about when God calls us out. We're gonna do part two today, when God calls us out. We're talking about Jeremiah, and we're kind of camping out in Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah, for those of you who may not know, if you haven't heard last week, um, you know, Jeremiah's book, the book of Jeremiah, was is really uh, a book with an overarching theme of judgment. And Jeremiah was around 20 years old when he first started to prophesy, and really, um, you know, continued for the rest of his adult life for some 40 years and more. That's a long time. And remember from last week, we talked about sort of Jeremiah's process when he was first called. He was kind of arguing, I'm too young. I'm only 20 years old. But God's like, don't say that you're too young. It doesn't matter. I don't look at you and qualify you by age. I qualify you by heart. I qualify you by readiness in your spirit. And so Jeremiah's ministry began in around 627 BC and ended sometime around 582 BC with his prophecy to the Jews who fled to Egypt. Because Jeremiah prophesied really in the final years of Judah before God's people were exiled to Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar, of course, ransacked it, uh, ransacked uh, Jerusalem, it makes sense that the book's overarching theme, like I already said, is judgment. And so Jeremiah had a daunting task. I mean, he was calling out disobedience. He's calling out sin. He's bringing ju God's judgment on the people for what was taking place and what was not taking place. Jeremiah was considered the weeping prophet. He just had a different type of of ministry, but an inspiring one. He was the one that said, I can't hold back. It's like the word of God is like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't hold it back. And even though it was hard, even though it was daunting, even though kind of like Ezekiel, it was being rejected, not received well. Uh, he could not hold his, his tongue back. It was like a fire. His God's word was like a fire shut up in his bones and it had to get out. And so we're gonna pick it up in Jeremiah chapter one, Verse 11, uh, several verses after what we talked about last week. Well, actually, we kind of went to, to verse 10, but start, start off in verse 11, so one verse after, technically. After he's called by God, and Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11 to 12 says this, Then the Lord said to me, look, look, very important um, statement, because this is the statement that God makes to us all the time. Look, Sean, look. Eduardo, look. Jennifer, look. Matt, look. This is a, a statement that he's always making to us because it's not because he doesn't know what we're going to see. He wants us to see the way he sees. And so when God says look, he's not saying look the way you normally look. He's saying look the way that I look. Look deeper. Look beyond just the surface. Look into the depth of what I Am doing. He says, look, Jeremiah, what do you see? Once again, it's not because God doesn't know what's in front of him. It's not because, and whether this was a natural illustration, I mean, I believe it was really a vision um, and God was using a natural, you know, element in a spiritual vision. But he says, look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And this is what Jeremiah said. I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. So God says, look, what do you see? And he has this vision and he sees a branch of an almond tree. And verse 12, then the Lord said, that's right. And it means that I am watching and I will certainly carry out my plans. Now, I love this because when Jeremiah was asked the question, 
and I will teach this in my my school of the supernatural supernatural leadership school. Uh, you know, when God asks a question like this, like, "Look, what do you see?" Jeremiah's response wasn't the outcome or the interpretation. Jeremiah didn't say, "I see that you are watching." and that you will certainly carry out your plans. Jeremiah says, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then God helps him through interpretation see what God's actually trying to get him to see. Other words, in life, in every situation in life, we are given two opportunities to see. One, to see, of course, what we see in the natural, what we see in front of us, the problem, the challenge, the tests, Whatever it is that we're facing, the unanswered prayer, we see the division in society, we see war, we see famine, we see fear, all those kind of things. But then God wants us to look a little bit deeper. He wants us to see beyond what we see. This was the goal in Mark chapter 6. and I, One of my favorite chapters in the, the gospel of Mark to preach from was when they didn't have enough loaves and fishes. And, you know, God is, you know, is with them. Uh, in this process, and there's like thousands of thousands of people because, you know, the men were only counted, so probably about 20,000 or more people. They had no fish, no loaves, not enough to feed all of them. They were all hungry, and the disciples were like, let's send them away. The people, it's time for them to eat. They're hungry. It's getting late. You've been teaching all day, and Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat, and then he says, go and see, and so when they went and saw that they didn't have enough loaves and fish, they were like, we cannot feed them because they already knew they didn't have enough loaves and fish. But the go and see statement uh, was really to help unlock in the disciples their ability to see a second layer deep, to see beyond what they see. This is happening to Jeremiah. This is what happens to all of us. I you know I, I, I train and, and equip people to recognize the voice of God. This is what I've done. This is actually, you know, the beginning of all that we we started with as a ministry, you know, Kingdom Culture Ministries. Not, no church, community at this time involved uh, as an itinerant traveling around the world. I would teach my schools on topics that surround this concept of what we're reading today, about learning to go beyond, to interpret what God is saying to us. When God's voice speaks, we can't just stop at the word. We have to say, God, what does the word mean? Where, where, where are you taking this word? How can I interpret this word? The, the story or the journey of our spiritual leadership really is about interpreting all that God is doing in and through our lives. And so, you know, when you have something in front of you, always ask the question, God, help me to see beyond that thing. Help me to see beyond that situation. It's, you know, and I, I want to make this statement, write this down if you're taking notes. We see one thing and God sees another. Write that down, put it on your fridge in this season, you know, paint it on your body, do something, write a note for yourself, put it on your ceiling when you wake up in the morning. We see one thing and God often sees another. We see the branch of an almond tree, but God sees that it means that he's watching us and he will certainly are watching and certainly carry out his plans. I'm just referring to verse 12 of chapter one of Jeremiah. This is the journey that we're all on with the voice of God and dealing simply with life in general. So for when God calls us out, part two, we're talking about how he teaches us in relationship, in the context of our calling being um, fulfilled or worked out in our life. As we talked about several weeks ago, the calling is simple. It's not um, <coughs> excuse me. It's not so complicated. First and foremost, we're calling us to love God and love people, to love him, make his name known, to simply invite people into a journey of the gospel, salvation, knowing him in a relationship. Like you want to, you don't have to complicate his calling. But what I just want to say is that we are called to look deeper as we fulfill this calling, as it's worked out in our life, part of him leading us is to continue to look beyond what we see. Now, God is always asking us, like I said, what we are seeing so that we can hopefully see beyond what we are seeing. And uh, several weeks ago, I, you know, it was uh, during the week and uh, something came up that kind of disturbed me a little bit and uh, I, I, I couldn't sleep. I was up 
uh, relatively late. I couldn't sleep. It was rattling me. It was like bothering me. And I was praying. And the prayer that I was praying was, God, help me see. Like, help me see. Like, because right now I can't sleep, can't rest my mind, can't rest my spirit. I feel like my soul is vexed. I can't fall asleep. So the only prayer I can pray is help me to see, like, what am I not seeing? Like, why? I, I want to access peace. I want to access, I want to feel the peace of God right now. I definitely don't feel any peace. I feel chaos inside of me. What do I need to see to access that peace? Because this is the thing. When we see right, we live right. When we see what God is doing, we will experience the grace of God in a way that will empower us to overcome the thing that may be vexing us at the moment. So I said, God, help me to see. And I don't know, maybe it was within a few seconds or so, I I wanted to see what time it was because I was getting really annoyed that I couldn't fall asleep. And I opened my phone and it says, uh, it says 111. It was 111 in the morning. And immediately my spirit jumped to Jeremiah 1 verse 11. Jeremiah 1 verse 11. And which is partly, you know, the inspiration for this message, to be honest with you, or this little mini series that uh, we're, we're, we're in right now on Jeremiah. And immediately my, my spirit leapt to Jeremiah 111, where God asks him, what do you see? And then he brings him further and gives him understanding of really what it is that God is saying. And when I when I felt that, it was like peace came into my soul and I began to see the situation differently and I began to pray into the situation differently and I began to see a different perspective of the thing that was bothering and vexing me. And it shifted my whole, uh, you know, actually I fell asleep and it, it actually helped me and into the morning helped guide my heart and guide my perspective in a way that I really, I really needed. And so this is so important. This is going to feel a little bit more of like a quick, I think, devotional on this fine summer day online for you. So, you know, if it's too short, I apologize. If it's too long, I apologize, but I think it's just perfect. So I want you to write this down. Shallow thinking is shallow faith. Shallow thinking is shallow faith. I want to encourage all of us not to over-spiritualize everything, but I would always rather, if I had to pick, between over-spiritualizing everything and under-spiritualizing everything and missing what God wants to do, I'm always going to pick over-spiritualizing everything. Now, I'm not saying to do that. I'm not saying to go out of your way to over-spiritualize everything and see something in everything, okay? I'm not saying that. But with everything in your relationship with God, when you're facing, if you have a revelation that God is good, if you have an understanding that God is your victor, he's going to help you get through this, you say it all the time. He's your strength. You know, in my weakness, he is strong. You know, God's grace is sufficient. If, if, if we're going through something and we have a trust and revelation of how we are capable by his grace to navigate through that something, then when we're going through it, don't just stop and look at the thing for what it is. Don't just think about it in a shallow way. Think about it in a deep way. Look at it from a deep way. Ask God the question, help me to see. Help me to see, because right now, I can't see. All I see is the issue. Help me to see beyond the issue, the situation, the challenge, the problem. Help me to see the opportunity, to see different. And, uh, you know, it just happened, you know, even this, how this word unfolded several weeks ago, even just days later, another thing happened. And my initial response was like, oh, this is so frustrating, you know? And why does this happen? Like, why is this happening? Why does it feel like, you know, I can't, I can't push forward in this one area. Why does it happen? And then God gave me a strategy. God said, are you seeing right? Are you seeing right? And I thought to myself, I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Two days ago, I had this word, Jeremiah 111. You asked me, what do I see? I woke up at 111. Right now I'm reminded again, two days later, and I'm like, hey God, Help me to see. And immediately, I saw a strategy. Now, no idea how that's going to unfold, but I saw a strategy. God helped me to redirect my sight, to look a little deeper, because shallow thinking is shallow faith. And if you think shallow about things because you only see them at face value, you will not operate in faith. You know, the way we think about something or someone will determine what we see in that something 
or someone. Apply this to every area of your life. Because our mindsets, our pain, our traumas, our fears, our insecurities all have a way of altering what we are capable of seeing. They all have a way of influencing us, intoxicating our ability to see right, to see the way God wants us to see. We know we have our own sight and then we have God's sight. And the latter is always our goal. There's always two sights. There's our sight and there's God's sight. There's the way we see things and there's the way that God sees things. And this is the way it is all throughout scripture. God correcting his people to see the situation right, to see it different when it's hard, to see that God, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Jeremiah chapter one, verse 11. Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? God's asking you today, what do you see? Do you see the situation only or do you see my hand in the situation and what I want to do from the situation? Now, let's just examine this a little bit because I thought this is kind of interesting. Well, I've always thought this was interesting and it, this has actually been a, uh, uh, a word that's helped guide something that God spoke to me over a decade ago now. And uh, I've always really just loved this verse, to be honest with you. But um, I love the way he interprets it because at face value, reading the English translation, you're thinking, how does the interpretation that God gave Jeremiah in verse 12 relate at all to an almond tree, a branch of an almond tree? So let's examine this a little bit. The name here adopted for the almond tree actually means wakeful. Okay, because the almond blossoming in January is the first to wake from to wake from the sleep of winter. So when he says, I see a branch of an almond tree in the context, it literally means to wake up to be the first. I'm going to fulfill this word quickly. I'm the first to blossom out of all the other trees, out of all the other uh, uh, shrubs. I'm the first to blossom from the wake of of winter. I'm blossoming in a time when no other thing is blossoming. It, it, it can be interpreted as a symbol for swift fulfillment of his word. The Hebrew name for the almond tree, like I said, means the wakeful or it means the vigilant because this tree begins to blossom and expand its leaves in January when other trees are still in winter sleep, producing fruit often in March, okay? So this word rendered, I can say it another way, many different ways of saying it, definitions, comes from a root that signifies to be awake, which literally gives the interpretation, at least in the New Living Translation, that's right, it means that I am watching, I'm awake, I'm aware, and I will certainly carry out my plans. It will have to happen swiftly, okay? What I'm about to do through you, in you, um, around you will happen swiftly. So I'm getting your attention. Look at it a little bit deeper. Don't think shallow about it. I'm gonna give you insight. I've already brought correction and guidance to your life like we talked about last week. Okay, I'm bringing correction and guidance to your life. You've given me the excuse. You're too young. Don't say that you're too young. I've appointed you. Remember, I knew and foreordained all of this before you were even in your mama's womb. Talked about that last week. Okay, and now I'm guiding you to this place and don't worry, it's gonna happen quickly. You're gonna have assurance, the assurance that you need to have so you have a confidence that truly I will be your protector. And then he goes on in verse 13, Jeremiah chapter 1, 13 to 19, okay? Again, he asks him a second time. This is the journey. And honestly, I would say that this is a great blueprint, a great blueprint for understanding the method of communication that God uses to his people. So I'm kind of speaking practically right now. I'm, 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 I'm kind of teaching you a little bit. I'm kind of more of like an encouraging devotional, but I hope that there can be some instruction. The Holy Spirit can give you some instruction as to the type of, or the method, the methods of communication that God will often use to interact with his people. And it's often through questions. God will get our, our attention. If we're really listening, God will say, stop. Pay attention. Look at that thing right there. What do you see? What do you, if we're paying attention and we're in that place of rest in God, we will be able to be interrupted in our everyday life and see what God wants us to see. Verse 13 says this, Then the Lord spoke to him, or me again, and asked, What do you see now? 
So you see this interaction. What do you see now? I'm teaching you, Jeremiah. You're my prophet. I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I foreordained all this. I appointed you before you were in your mother's womb. Okay, this is all part of the plan. I'm teaching you now as my prophet, someone who represents the voice of God, represents me as God to the people. I'm training you. I'm discipling you by asking you questions. One of the greatest ways that rabbis would actually disciple their disciples would be by asking them questions. And, uh, and that's what a good counselor does, right? It, a good counselor will ask you questions so that you hear your own answer. A good counselor is not supposed to give you all the answers. A good counselor will help you come to your own answer. And yes, they already have the answer probably, but they want you to journey this journey of healing to come to your own conclusion and answer. And this is often why the, how the rabbis would disciple their disciples. And in fact, when people would ask Jesus a question, you can read it, the religious in the gospels, he would respond with a question. Because also it wasn't just about giving you an answer to all your questions. It was about not giving you an answer so you could actually come full circle, literally full circle as a leader and develop a culture or a, an ability within you to search out the answer yourself and not just get all the answers handed to you, okay? So he asks the question again, what do you see now? And I replied, I see a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. Verse 14, God says to him, yes, the Lord said, for terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. Once again, he saw something but he had to go a little bit deeper. God gave him the interpretation. He didn't say, I see the interpretation. I see terror from the north that will boil out on the people of this land. No, he just saw the pot of boiling water spilling from the north. And this is like voice of God dealing with visions 101 right here. This is like, let's just call it this for a second. Voice of God dealing with visions. Just made that up right now. 101. God will ask you, what do you see? And then the goal is to get you to acknowledge first the surface so that he can bring you into the deep. This is what God has called us to do. Remember, they were, the disciples in John chapter 21 were fishing all night and they were in the shallows, so to speak. They were casting their net, not getting anything. They only got something when they went deeper. God said, cast out into the deep, go out a little further, throw your nets out into the deep and you'll catch fish. They're like, no way, we've been doing this all night. You know, at that point they didn't know it was Jesus until after they caught the fish, but they're like, we've been doing this all night and there's nothing. And you're telling us to go a little bit deeper. Okay, fine, we went to the, and so they go out a little bit deeper and they catch so much fish they can hardly bring it in. And then they have a revelation. Oh my gosh, this is Jesus, the Messiah resurrected on the beach with us. This is crazy, mind blowing moment, you know? And, but this is, this is how, this is what relationship with God looks like. When we live in the shallow, we don't access the, 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 the blessing, the favor, the breakthroughs of God. And it's only until we go a little bit deeper, we dig a little bit, we move when we don't want to move, we move into the dark when we are scared to move into the dark places of life. We, we, we just go places that we don't feel comfortable going. It's in those spaces, in those moments that we uncover and discover the depth of what God wants us to do in and through our lives. So he said in verse 14, yes, the Lord said, for terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. And he goes into this whole, you know, judgmental or sorry, judgment focused prophetic word. Listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. I, the Lord, have spoken. They will set their thrones at the gates of the city. They will attack its walls and all the other towns of Judah. I will pronounce judgment on my people for all their evil, for deserting me and burning incense to other gods. Yes, the worship of idols. They worship idols made with their own hands. Get up, Jeremiah is saying. Get up, prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them. I love that. I love it. Foresee, verse 18, foresee today I have made you strong like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, the people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you and I will take care of you, the Lord. I, the Lord, have spoken. What a powerful word. Basically, he sandwiches this amazing promise 
in the beginning and in the end, he sandwiches in the middle is this like judgmental meat, this scary task, this crazy thing that's going to take place that nobody probably wants to be the messenger of. And at the end, he's like, I've made you strong like a fortified city. They'll fight you, but they will fail. I am with you. I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And this all came out of a space of him first being open to see through what he saw. Okay, yet you, I hope that this is making sense to you watching right now because God will always allow situations in our life for us to see things. And if we just stop there and don't listen and don't ask God to give us sight beyond what we see, we'll just move on with our lives. So many people tell me all the time, I had a dream. I'm like, what was the dream? Well, I saw this, this, and this. I'm like, well, what does it mean? I don't know. Have you taken time to listen? Have you asked God to help you see beyond just what you saw in the dream? To see into the interpretation, to see what God is trying to speak to you and through you and how he wants to lead you in this process. You're in a situation right now where you're in trouble. There's a problem that you're facing. It's easy just to go around and say, this is a problem, I have a problem, look at my problem. And But my question to you is, have you stopped and said, God, help me to see what about this? Is there something that you want to say that goes beyond this problem? That's on the other side of this problem that maybe I am missing right now. This happened so many times. I mean, it happened when David was appointed by the prophet Samuel and he was the last of his brothers. He wasn't even in the, didn't even make the cut. He wasn't even in the lineup. And Samuel, the first guy that, the firstborn son of Jesse that Samuel, uh, you know, was was looking at, he assumed that because he was the strong, strapping firstborn, I mean, the firstborn had the blessing, he assumed, this guy was a man of war, that this man, the firstborn of Jesse, would be the next king. We know that David was the next king, but, this, but Samuel the prophet, who was a prophet, he actually just saw. He saw with his natural eyes, didn't see with his spiritual eyes, and he assumed that this man was the man that was going to be anointed to be the next king. And of course, we know the story. God said to Samuel, you're judging on the outside. God does not look on the outside. He looks at the heart. What you've seen has stopped you from seeing. What you see in front of you has stopped you from seeing. That was the same problem with the religious. And it's always with the rebuke. And it was carried over from an Old Testament prophecy that in seeing they would see... Or, or sorry, in seeing they would not see, in hearing they would not hear. This was basically about the religious people. They would see, they saw the Messiah in front of them. They saw what they were waiting for, but they couldn't see with spiritual eyes. They were hearing the reports. They were hearing the good news, but they weren't hearing with spiritual ears. And so we always have this opportunity to, to go a layer deep, to not be in shallow thinking, because if we're in shallow thinking, we will always be in shallow faith. And of course, David eventually asks, is any more people that, you know, you're, we're missing here? Because uh, I don't see now, now that I have the rebuke from God, I don't see who the next king is. And Jesse's like, actually, there's a guy, he's the, you know, the least of all these guys. His name's David, and he's taking care of the sheep as a shepherd, you know, worship, little worship leader, poetic writer on the, the hilltop, you know, creative guy, and he's out there, and, and you know, yeah, he's the, he, and then so Samuel, of course, said he's the guy and anointed him as king. But we see it also, you know, I love the story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16 to 20, when it came to Elisha um, and his servant. And remember the story where the armies were coming at them and they're about to attack and his servant gets up and he opens his eyes and he sees all these armies coming after after them and they're they're gonna lose. They're 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 gonna lose. They're in trouble. And Elisha prays for his servant and saying in verse 16, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. But he wasn't praying for the natural eye. He was praying for the spiritual eye because the servant was seeing the fact that they were in trouble. The armies were coming after them. We're going to take them out. They were going to lose. And yet God or Elisha prays for the spiritual eyes of his servant. I'm not going to read the rest of the verse, but really I wanted to share and give you sort of an illustration of what God always wants from us, and that's to see different. Elisha prayed that his servant wouldn't just see with one sight, but he would see with spiritual sight. He would see that there were more for him 
than against him. That there was an invisible realm around the situation that was going to protect him and keep him secure. And this is the value. This is the, the, the hope that God has for us to look a little deeper, to not be shallow in our thinking, to look beyond what just stands in front of us. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Because of Jesus, we have a reconciled relationship with God. You know what that means? It means that often we see, even in our own lives, we see a lack of self-worth. We see a lack of value. We see sin. We see the condemnation, they feel the shame. We we go through all these emotions. We feel maybe bad about ourselves or we're not measuring up. We're not measuring up to the standard. But when God looks at us, if you are in relationship with Jesus, when God looks at you, he sees his righteousness. He sees the reconciliation that you have with the Father. Let me continue reading in verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He's not counting your sins against you. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, listen to this, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him we have become the righteousness of God. When God sees you, he sees righteousness. What you, The best prayer that you can pray in this season is, God, I don't feel good. I feel like I've messed it all up. I feel like I'm not where I should be. Help me to see. Help me to look a little deeper. You've called me out. You've called me to something great. And I'm going through this. I feel this right now. Help me to see a little bit deeper. Start there. God, you see the righteousness of God. Help me to see the righteousness of God on the inside. From that place, help me to live and lead a life that honors you in Jesus' name. I pray that in this season, the voice of God will become so much more clear to you and that you'd go beyond what you see in the natural and begin to see in a way that you've never seen before so that you can apprehend things in your life, in your leadership, in, within your calling that you've never apprehended before in Jesus' name. God bless you, Kingdom Culture, and we will see